Well, hello everybody. Today is the 1st of January in the new year of 2014. I hope everybody had a nice New Year celebration and you didn't do anything that you would regret in the upcoming 2014 year. <laughs> but today on the bench, I had some free time. I thought that I'd open this B&K Model 465 CRT tester up and take a look inside and see what kind of shape she's in if it needs any capture placed or any work like that done. Uh, 1965 this unit was built so uh, do the math it's 49 years old this year like I need another project to work on I still have this Admiral sitting over here I haven't put the uh, dial light back on yet because I just haven't had time to mess with it the Stuart Warner saga I'm planning to get back into that this weekend don't worry you haven't missed nothing I didn't even touch that power transformer for it it's still sitting back here waiting for its new wires to be soldered on and take care of the paint and all that good stuff so you all ain't missed nothing there it's still as it was I've made some new copies and stuff of the power supply I'm going to run through in the next issue so just to give you something to think about and I also have that Pioneer sitting back over there on the other side of the room that I'm dinking around with that one after talking to a few people still kind of leaving me with some uh, gray areas that a uh, couple folks might believe that it's a power supply issue and even one viewer commented that he believed that it might be a uh, a uh, bad capacitor somewhere in the output stage of the amplifier but we'll get back to that another time so I'll get this taken out of the case and we'll take a look inside and see what we have Alright, for any of you that's ever wondered what the inside of a B&K 465 CRT tester looks like, here we go. This is a solid state unit, being it doesn't use tubes, it has a power transformer. And it's a pretty straightforward shotgun recap. You have two 50 microfarad at 450 work electrolytics. These are in the dynamic uh, intensifier circuit. And then you have two 5 microfarad at 450 volt caps, which are a branded a B and K product here and here. And these are in the G2 voltage section here and here with our 50 microfarads here and here. And that's the nice thing with this. Uh, the power, the, the owner's manual, I should say, contained a schematic of this unit. And that is nice and that's very helpful. <laughs> so the recap is fairly straightforward now being this is a precision test piece of equipment I will go through and test the resistors I don't expect many if any to be out but you might find that they are there's a couple uh, there's a 10 percent wire wound down here another little resistor and I misspoke when I said this was from 1965 now they might have built this particular tester beginning in 1965 but the date codes I'm seeing, especially this one right here on the meter, read September 2nd, 1966. And uh, over here on the schematic, there's a revised stamp that says March 28th of 66. And I see in here every so often, uh, where was it at? Here we go, there's 21 of 66, the 21st week of 1966. So, I mean, nobody has done anything to this. It's never been worked on. Here, these are the 26th week of 1966. So I'll dig around. I know I have something that's equivalent to a 50 microfarad. I've got some 0.47s or a 47 microfarads, and I think I've got some 68. So I can come up with something to make that work. The five, on the other hand, I don't know if I have anything quite that small. I have to dig through the old stash and test some. I might be able to come up with some tens to put in there, but I don't have any. It's five. So, I'll do some digging around and see what I have. And uh, here's the basic design of this thing. It's just a wood box with uh, wood pieces glued to the outside perimeter that the aluminum sheet frame here screws into. And then your wires come out the bottom. And it needs a good thorough cleaning. There's a lot of pet hair in here. And, uh, obviously, it's never been a part. It's all original. Here's the other side of the box. I'm going to clean this up, probably do some armor all work to it. And spruce it up some. 
I really wish the lid come off of this like some of the other test equipment I have that uh, superior tube tester I have back here that lid will slide to the side you can pull the lid off makes it kind of handy to use it in a tight spot or this one you just have to leave it up or push it back out of the way so let me do some digging for some capacitors and I'll be right back so here's where we're at with this B&K465 um, I wanted to replace these electrolytic caps right here and here the thing of it is I don't have anything with leads coming out either end I've only got leads coming out one end and uh, what I have would be very usable as a replacement. These are a 47 microfarad at 250 volts, but I don't like that voltage. 250 volts, these are a 450 volt capacitor right here. So I want to go with something that can uh, back me up at least equal to, if not greater than what these original ones was. So that kind of skunks that. As for the five microfarads. I've had some 4.7 microfarads, but again, they're only 150 working volts, where again, these are 450. So, I did some testing on them uh, in circuit. These test about 6.7 on both of them, and the 150 tested, I think it was 56 microfarads, and this one over here tested about 61. So, they're, they're still within their design specs of 20% plus or minus. So my next step is to test some of these resistors that are in certain circuits here that I want to make sure that are still within tolerance and I'll get back with you here in a minute. Alrighty, I tested the bigger value resistors. This guy here is a 820K. Uh, this one over here, I checked him, he's an 820K. And I checked the one 10 ohm wire wound right here, 5 water, he's okay. This 2.457 water, he's okay. The rest of them look alright. Now I did find one spot over here, somebody had, had some repair work, either that or one of the technicians of being case, kind of a sloppy solder. Uh, there's a spot right down in here, it's got a burnt spot in the wire, but this little diode right here looks fairly modern compared to the ones that are up here. He's a, it's, a, it's clear instead of uh, black like these old school ones are but you know how long ago this might have been I don't know that could have been in here 30 40 years who knows what does amaze me about this is that there's a lot of plastic vinyl covered wire but there's also an equal amount of uh, cloth covered wire in here too so kind of a neat little fact but so far so good I'll give us a quick cleanup and I think we'll go pull the back off the Admiral and give that CRT a test quick bath with some soap and water made that case look a lot more respectable. Brightened it up quite a bit on the inside. And probably sooner or later I'll take some navel jelly to that hinge right there. He's kind of stiff but I'll put a few dollops of uh, liquid bearing on there and let it soak in. That'll free it up pretty good. This thing I assume was probably stored in the basement or someplace that was damp for a while. It's just got that musty vintage electronics goodness smell <laughs> a lot of you know what I mean by that so I'll uh, knock my coffee over I'll uh, clean up this unit next and wipe down the cords real good and inspect everything one more time and we'll give it a go from there that goes to show you how dirty that B and K CRT tester was that's pretty grungy looking Ugh. so check her out now. she got some shine on her courtesy armor roll. <laughs> Cleaned up really nice. Get rid of all the grunginess down in here. Cords cleaned up really well. They were kind of a mill dude. And I did plug it in. It does function. I adjusted the heater voltages and stuff like that. And they seemed stable. I let it on. There was no fluctuation in the needles or anything like that. A little bit of grunge here and there, but not bad for a tester that's almost 50 years old. Okay, so we got the CRT tester installed on the Admiral 19XP4 pitcher tube using socket B like it says in the manual. And we've set our filament voltage to 6.3 volts as it says again in the setup manual. This is our guy right here. 
We have a 6.3 volt heater voltage, test socket B, G2 should be at 300, and G1 range should be between 24 and 94. So far, everything's testing out and going the way it should. It's said to allow three minutes of warm up time for the pitcher tube to uh, begin its test, and we have passed that by a couple minutes now. It says to set the function switch in the shorts position, okay, which we're in. Interpret the shorts lights using the table below. This table is also shown in the setup chart. Uh, let's see, the tube shows no shorts go on to the emission tests. Well, if it was shorted, one of those would light up, so we pass that. Tap the tube lightly while performing the shorts test. Okay. Well, no lights lit. Alrighty, let's go on to the emissions test for black and white tubes. That's a section for color and for black and white. And set the switch to the emissions control, which we did. If the meter reading is in the good area, go on to step three. If the meeting reader meeting, okay, try this again, dummy. If the meter reading is in the bad area, refer to later section on restoring emissions. According to this, we have zero emissions whatsoever. Okay, that's probably not good. <laughs> Uh, let's see, set the function switch to the cutoff position. Slowly rotate G1 volts from zero until the meter pointer rests over the cutoff mark. And according to this, we have no cutoff control either on that, not whatsoever. If G1 volt setting is not within the range given, in the setup chart the tube should be rejected because the contrast range of a cathode ray tube is directly related to the cutoff characteristic. Alrighty, well, I hate to say it, I think this thing is pretty well dead if that's uh, what we're supposed to have because emissions, nothing, that, ne that needle doesn't even move. I'll do some checking here, make sure I have this thing hooked up correctly, so bear with me. And here's where we're at with the 19XP4 pitcher tube in this Admiral, which at first was dead in the water, showed no emissions or cut off or anything. So uh, reading through the literature for the BNK465 CRT tester, I went ahead and performed a dynamic intensifier uh, procedure on this particular tube. And it suggests to start in the low range, check your emissions and cutoff, uh, which in our case there was none. Went up to the medium, and the emissions and cutoff started to come up slightly on the meter. Still was in the bad range. And I uh, went ahead and bumped it up to the dynamic high, hit the button, come back to the emissions and cutoff range. And here's what we have. We're in the green now, and it's between 4 and 5 and our cutoff, we go over to cutoff here, we're supposed to be between 24 and 94 I believe and it should come back and rest over the cutoff indicator here so we'll go up here to about 24 and it cuts off right where I said it should yeah that looks really good, we got cutoff control now between 24 and 94, I'm sorry, it's 94. It's about right there is 94. So that looks good. Back to the emissions again. It's just barely hanging in there. This ain't a very strong pitcher tube. So what it tells us to do after we've uh, restored it using the dynamic intensifier portion of this tester is to set it to emissions, which we're in, and to do a life test on it, which basically will show uh, the condition of the tube over a long period of time under test conditions here. So we 
We'll go ahead and press our life test button in now. She's dropping like a rock. Now we're into the bad ain't range. Bad, bad, bad. Still dropping. Almost back to zero. And we're just about <laughs> one dot above zero. Got that off of it now. She's slowly coming back online. But at least it rebounds back into the green. That's good. And it come back up to just about where it was sitting at beforehand. Awesome. So, I mean, it's not the strongest pitch or two, but after a quick rejuvi, it uh, might have a little bit of life left in it. So I'll go ahead and, and uh, put the TV back together. Or put a cheater cord on it, I should say, and put our socket back on. And see what that picture looks like. Maybe it'll be a little bit brighter, even though we don't really have any reception on this set. But uh, the, the raster might look a little bit better, maybe. Alright, so I have a cheater cord on it. Let's see what it does. Here she comes. Hey, look at there. Oh, that's much better. Wow. Still no response from anything else. We have brightness now. Look at that. We have our contrast. That's our horizontal hold. That's our vertical hold. She ain't got the best looking picture, but that's not bad. I'm looking better and better. She's still very dark around the edges. I don't think this tube has a whole lot of life left in her. It looks like as it's sitting there, it's shaking. I mean, you can't tell that in the camera, of course. There we go. I'll tell you what, she looks a lot better than what she did. Much better. So now it's just getting into the part of restoring the electronics part. We got a little bit of life breathe, breathe back into this tube. Courtesy of the BNK465, which is a $35 pick off of eBay. It proved itself to be very useful here. Stay tuned, folks. I don't think this is the end quite yet.